All right, hello everyone. I'm here for episode six of Psychologist vs. God. Um, I have a special guest with me here today, Pavel Vingsen, correct? Uh, he's from Mississauga, Ontario, uh, which is near Toronto. Um, I was reflecting on his book in episode five, and I totally uh, mispronounced his name uh, without uh, meaning to. Um, but you know, Pavel tells me I can I can call him uh, uh, Pablo or Paul or any of any name that I like. <laughs> So thanks for being here today, Pavel. And um, uh, I was hoping to just get to know you um, a little bit uh, deeper. Um, and thanks, by the way, so much for coming on the show. Um, so you wrote this book, Be, uh, Be Human, Not a Zombie, A Guide to Your Fundamental Human Nature. Did I say that right? Uh, a guide to finding your fundamental nature. A guide pretty, to find pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> Sorry about that again. Um, so I just wanted to just mention as well. So the whole point about meeting with people is because um, I really like to do kind of qualitative work, and the the. I think the closest I've come come to understanding humans and humanity and getting close to the truth has been with like meeting with lots and lots of people through my mental health practice. And so this podcast is about trying to find some of that um, subtle, deep information through interviewing people. And um, I really, I'm, I think that's the best way to try, to try and understand things. Is I think it's much better than um, other ways, you know, that we can learn because uh, there's you know there's so much subtlety to human life and um, the stories that people tell can can give us just more depth so yeah Pavel I'm wanting to just learn a bit about your life so how did so did you grow up in Canada or um, so first thanks for having me on your podcast I found like the title really fascinating <laughs> and that's kind of like what um, yeah I, I'm grateful for that um, but yeah, I actually, I was born in Poland and I moved to Canada at age six and then um, grew up to like most of my like youth and teenage years was spent here. And then I went to the States for like tennis endeavors. So I spent another nine years there and then I uh, came back to Ontario again. Okay. Um, and one of the things that really struck me when I was reading your book, I was like, I was like, wow, like this guy is like, he's, there's so much similarity to like, what I, what I think I experienced and I could just, I was just resonating with it and kind of going like, so, you know, he, he discovered that when you're, you kind of become institutionalized in a way that there's something that's not quite right about it and something that just feels off like is that what you experienced like in your growing up years and your development yeah totally um i i never really even also like school like i it was just like i'm more um experiential i guess you can say with the body and like i'm i'm drawn to sports and doing things with my hands and like just being out in in the world like experiencing it and then I always felt like I was kind of like an outcast in school because even just like when the teacher asked questions it seemed like many people kind of like gave the same types of answers and then I was always like in my mind like oh I'm thinking kind of different here and um, and I started kind of just like uh, I don't know, living in my own little bubble, I would say, in some ways. Like, I just wanted to get out of school as fast as possible to do sports. But um, but then I also, yeah, just kind of like uh, hung around my friends. And, and even there, I just always felt too like um, I kind of didn't think the way they thought in things. But I also just kept it to myself and kind of like, uh, I knew in the like deep down I think like I was kind of pretending a lot of the times to be like oh yeah I like this or I like that just to to feel uh, included in things like 
the movies like people talk about or music they talk about like I mean some things yeah I had like of course similarities with my friends but it was always weird to me I felt like I just felt different in some ways um, just because I couldn't like uh, like the conversations that my friends had were always like remembering some kind of stats or facts about like whether it's sports or they were always thinking who's the greatest player or this and um, I just couldn't um, recall a lot of the things too so I think like my sister recently told me like um, I might be dyslexic because also like even in school I was um, I, I failed English like twice. <laughs> um, my, my papers were always written up with red and stuff and I, I didn't understand like I, pretty much English was my first language because I, even though I came from Poland at age six I took some like ESL classes but eventually just like kind of moved into the thing but um, so so yeah I think uh, just being in society like doing the kind of like baseline thing what society tells you to do I feel like that kind of takes you out of your own uniqueness right like authenticity because we're all kind of slightly different in all sorts of things even though most people might seem similar but in in deep down when you look you have certain different interests the way you view the world and certain subjects is different and um, being put in like a little box makes you kind of like start kind of shutting off who you really are really right because that isn't like expressed and then you have to kind of live in this um, smaller space that you can say I guess were you um, um were you exposed were you or um, required to participate in any traditions religious stuff anything like that when you were young yes so I actually grew up Catholic like my my um, my parents were but we weren't right really like crazy serious like my my grandparents were like they they're in Poland especially they're very by like um, the book they always go to church everything is 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 um, geared towards that but here like my parents like made us go to church and then like even go to Catholic school but um, we were kind of just like goofing off sometimes like it was my best place to take naps <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so everybody would say like when I go to church I, t I take a good like I'm always sleeping so um, <laughs> like I tried to like learn it and stuff and I guess like I got good certain things from it for sure like I can relate to some stuff like some teachings and such but it, I never took it like too crazy seriously and, um, and um, so, so it wasn't like it wasn't a huge like part a huge of your family, family identity, identity. Like, you could, like you could take it or leave it is that what you mean, that what you mean? Uh, yeah like I mean we still kind of did it just because that was what we knew and it kind of like um, even though uh, so so now like my parents are more like even open-minded too right so they're just like they, my mom goes to church once in a while but it's not like something that it has to be done so they were kind of like lenient especially when we got older like teenagers and stuff we had the choice to do what we wanted which was like the most beautiful thing my parents were able to do for us is give us like a, a space to explore ourselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no pressure no then pressure one way or the other no yeah, I, I agree. That is a, I think that is a nice thing. Um, and uh, so, that, yeah, you don't really have an emotional struggle about, um, I guess, being connected with others in that way. Um, like you would feel connection no matter what, right? Um, no matter what you decided. Totally, yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of nice to just like, so for me, I was drawn into tennis and um, that's kind of that was always my kind of like uh, passion and I I did anything for tennis like <laughs> the amount of practice I would do is like 
uh, even if I had n nobody to play with, I would always just uh, go serve or play against the wall. It was just something like within me just saying like this is this is what I like. It's like this is what I need to do and that was my big kind of motivation to just uh, live life through and that was kind of like my community too in in some way you can say because tennis is like pretty s any sports right like if you do a certain sport you meet the same types of people and um mm -hmm. yeah mine was skateboarding that's what i did uh with uh for a long time and same thing uh you know right into it with all the movement and flow and friendship and um i don't know just um cultural stuff like um making videos about you know what we're doing that kind of stuff yeah totally and, uh, <laughs> even just the attire that we wear right like it's all kind of just it's all it's all unique to the to the sport right uh, it was sure. yeah it, it was a way of i don't know it was it was a way of getting through a, par a, a portion of life really um yeah i'm so yeah, thankful for it actually um, um uh, so i mean, so, I mean you, you you it sounds like you were kind of raised in just sort of a similar westernized way like i was um it sounds like uh your your family structure was pretty stable and um unless i'm missing something in that way um and and religious tradition wasn't really um there wasn't high pressure or any forcing that way um but you you still kind of figured out that um, you were kind of living in a box, as you were saying, right? And that, that analogy of a box is coming up a few times when I've talked with people. Can you, can you say more like how like that was to be, find yourself in that, in that kind of that limitation? Mm. Yes, like even actually uh, with my name. So I, I always noticed like so many people were kind of like, um, so attached to their name and for me because i guess mine is difficult so teachers would always struggle with it and i would be like i i didn't re like i got kind of like anxious when people were saying my name even because um they can never get it and it's always like trying to correct them and then eventually i started just kind of like dropping it like uh, i i wouldn't really care as much of it um, but I felt it was like kind of weird because always people would like laugh and stuff because the teacher couldn't say it the way I, my name was. So, mm. so I, I, in that sense, I was kind of uh, very enclosed. And then also like even though with my parents, we everything was kind of like free and stuff, but we also didn't didn't really talk about deeper subjects or like emotions or things like that like that uh, or anything about like mental health or like um psychology right like everything was kept inside and i didn't know i i could not understand like wh how things function in there because there's all this i felt all this energy always this kind of like um the strong force even in in tennis like when i got to tournaments i could never play uh well because i was so overwhelmed with the strong emotions and strong strong energy field you can say and um and yeah it was always uh, limiting me kind of um, lost your voice there for a second here did you? Oh, sorry. Oh, no. now, you're, now you're back. I think there was some background sound there. Mm. <laughs> sorry, continue. Yeah, so, so I felt like I was just kind of like almost living this kind of falsehood in some way because I was like trying to just fit in and just uh, pretend things don't bug me or like I like the things other people like, even just like with the normal stuff like going to clubs and drinking and like when you're on a tennis team or any team you're like kind of trying to belong and like um just not be an outcast right because as soon as like you you kind of express some emotions or thoughts that are different people like kind of latch on to it either they make fun of you or you're like and i guess unless you're like the alpha 
type male, then like people try to cling on to that um, and like become your friend because <laughs> you might beat them up. Or something. Right. <laughs> so, so I think, mm. yeah, in that sense, I felt like I was living almost like two lives. I wasn't really going through uh, my own stuff in some ways, obviously, like with tennis and uh, other stuff that were super strong, I would. I would go fully into it, but other stuff I was just kind of like shoving it somewhere in the back and um, pretending it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So there's, it sounds like there's something about the larger culture that you kind of recognized, I guess, that there, that it's, um, there could be missing uh, parts or restrictions or limitations in terms of uh, being able to be your, your total self. Um, and I see this a lot with, in my clients that I meet with in therapy, right? Like, it almost seems like almost nobody learns what it means to understand the emotional self um, or to have a good understanding of it so that, so that you can take care of that part of yourself. It's like people are learning for the first time, you know, when they're 35 or 40, like what it means to identify a range of emotional experience and, and um, like process it and let it kind of move through you. It's like, uh, it's, it's like, uh, this grand, uh, developmental void, I guess I would call it. I don't know if, if that, and I think that you were, I think you were kind of alluding to that. Like you're kind of saying like, you have to put on a mask, be kind of fake in a way in order to uh have this way of fitting in and if um i don't know if you try and say what's really going on to people and they get kind of weirded out or they might reject you or something like that yeah i think so because like we're so taught that like you have to kind of like blend in or like it feels like you have to do that right because it's always like even in school you see the the outcasts always getting picked on so you're like oh i need to just stay in this kind of bubble and like not not say too many things that might uh <laughs> get me not liked and getting picked on so you kind of like separate from like your your truth you can say and then you kind of like put on the mask as you said and and just kind of live through that but then but it's funny because I feel like you kind of know deep down that it's like you're doing something kind of like not wrong, but it's like a facade a little bit. And then it's almost like now that I reflected back, it's like, oh, you're separating and then you're getting further and further from that. And then you get lost, right? Like you, you, you shove it in the back and you, you put on a lie after a lie after a lie after a lie and then and then you don't even know what the truth is anymore because you're so far from it and you've told all these small lies you can say and then you're you're disconnected and and to find that again takes time right usually it's some kind of like shattering moment where you suffer a lot or like a big big um life scare happens like uh for me i would say it was like uh, so tennis was like my life it was like my identity everything revolved around tennis and um and when i was like 30 years old or a little bit before then like um i started getting into meditation a little bit because to help my tennis like through the especially the competition side like I could never understand why I got so like tensed up and like it almost like you become paralyzed even in matches because I, at the same time because of all those lies I I cared what everybody thought about me I didn't feel worthy I um, I, I always was scared when people were watching me if I uh, like didn't do well how they'd perceive me so it was always this kind of like um, this unworthiness I felt within myself even even I was talking with my mom uh, today and like like eye contact was such a 
I could never make eye contact with people for long periods of time because I was so kind of like ashamed or something within myself even it felt like that I, I was scared to be seen almost because um, yeah it's like probably because I've like kept lying to myself or not allowing my truth to kind of be the forefront of my experience and then that just makes you feel like you're not good enough and you have to pretend to or you uphold this kind of thing. And, and with tennis, that gave me a little bit of false hope because you get some um, good results and then people praise you. You're like, oh, you're a good player. So you feel like, oh, I'm empowered a bit. But that's so fleeting, right? Like Because you can only win so much and, and uh <laughs> And eventually that goes downhill. Even when you're the number one player in the world, a lot of them struggle uh, with themselves too after because it's like when you're at the top, it's a big drop down after, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I've heard that before too, where, you know, like athletes and um, I watched um, a documentary about my favorite skateboarders uh, in the what was called the Bones Brigade, Tony Hawk. Oh, I, these yes, guys. I watched that too. I love that. You, you watched it too. I love well, skateboarding they, yeah. too. Yeah, they made a yeah they made a documentary like whatever like twenty or thirty years after that was a big thing in the eighties, and they were talking about their lives and how they were sort of hooked on getting results in competitions and it was a big part of their self-esteem and self-worth and it was like they're always trying to protect their status and stuff like that so i mean yeah this is a very common thread in in, in um i guess in, in western culture anyway um so you you reached a point where you were like okay i'm i'm gonna do some searching and seeking is that right like you described that in your book yes so um there was a point so like after i finished university i moved to miami so i i went to school uh i got a scholarship to mich in michigan to a d2 school there and i played tennis for four years and and then after that i moved to miami where i was teaching tennis and um so i kind of like I, that tennis was my kind of goal right so it was like this big vision and i got there i I got a good job, I was teaching tennis, and then I noticed I'm still not happy like here. And and the cool thing about being there was like, um, I, I got to teach like super successful, wealthy, like CEO types and these people who are important figures, right? And then I'm like, these people are complaining to me a lot about all sorts of problems that they have. <laughs> and they're chasing other stuff and I'm like so, because I thought okay if I get a house now if I have this I'll be like happy and then I have this kind of cool career I'm I'm living in Miami teaching on this like little island and it's like amazing and I'm still like kind of miserable inside most days because I'm, I'm not understanding what, who I am, I'm chasing stuff. And that's that's kind of like the big kind of turning point, I would say, is like um, that and also like I, uh, me and my girlfriend broke up. So it was like a big shattering moment of like, cause we were dating for six years at that point. And, and when you kind of merge with someone, you kind of lose yourself also. But mm -hmm. when that breakup happened and all that kind of realizations, I like, was like, what is this like what am i and like how do i be happy in life or am i just gonna go every day and be like kind of okay but not really liking life i was like no i gotta get to the bottom of this and that's when i just started really like getting into like hours and hours of meditating just observing my mind i was really curious like what is this thing because it was so negative all the time and i found it so interesting that like people say that our mind is kind of us a lot of the times or nobody tells us otherwise and then this thing's always just negative always putting you down always thinking you're not good enough you're not worthy um and then i was like no, I got to find this out and then I'll, I'll continue kind of the other <laughs> life, I would say. And then that's kind of how I got into just sitting and observing and questioning and
doing yoga, I was just so tired of that kind of like disconnect. What did you discover when you were doing all that sitting? Like, what did it reveal to you? Um, so it just start, I started being able to, to, to start separating from my body and mind. Like, I always thought, like, I was this thing that, like, I thought I was my thoughts and I thought I was this body. Like, so, so when you start kind of going deep into meditations and, like, kind of having a little separation, you start becoming more of the observer. And in the beginning, I had no clue what this was. Like, I'm just, I, ha I had no, um, no kind of introduction to like people like from Eastern cultures or like the way of thinking of that um, like Buddhist kind of type stuff I was just like kind of uh, it was a weird experience because I'm like what is this thing I finally was able to kind of be just watching the the mind think and then also having a disconnect from also the body like it wasn't just like this is this is me i didn't know what i was anymore and it was like it was kind of scary in the beginning because you're like what is this thing am i like a, some kind of drugs or something <laughs> <laughs> and um but at, at the same time when i started getting into those moments i started feeling this like I, I need to do this more and more like I got to I have to explore this as much as possible because there's something there and I think because I was so curious about understanding what I am like what because you know how you can't really point to yourself like you can say you're your name or um, you're your your experiences or like past um, past things that you like a, a tennis player or whatever right but the, you can never get to this kind of like pointer of like where do you reside like am I in the mind am I in somewhere in the body where where do I exist and that was kind of like a big shattering moment when I started realizing that there's this you can get this separation mm -hmm. yeah I think yeah, I, 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 I think I experienced, experienced a similar, similar thing, thing. I don't, I don't know if it, if it went, went to the extent, extent that you have experienced. I'm not sure. Like, like um, um, I started, started learning a lot about, a lot about dialectical, dialectical behavior therapy, therapy because, because I struggled, I struggled with, with um, emotions, emotions and, and I, I think I was in a pattern of borderline personality disorder for part of my life, uh, uh, unconsciously. unconsciously. And, um, and, um, and then and I started learning about, learning about dialectical behavior therapy and one of the core, core um, um, skills in there it's called core mindfulness right so basically it's, it's saying that if you can't if you can't observe your thoughts then you can't make any changes basically like so if like if you're in a dark room you're just gonna trip all over the furniture right so you have to have a way of you have to have a way of turning on lights so that you can see when you're engaging in like distorted thinking and you can see when you know you're um, being irrational, basically, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can't step outside of yourself and see that, then you're just going to be kind of like meshed with it, and you're you're going to be running on autopilot and doing all these things that are ineffective in life, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I was able to 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 get to a a point of transcendence. I just don't know if I would call it like fully knowing who I am or not. Um, mm -hmm. However, yeah, like I was able to achieve an improved stability in my thoughts, emotions, and behavior. And to me, that was like monumental, right? Like it was like this huge paradigm shift where I was, before I was running unconscious on autopilot, saying and doing all these things that kind of made life unnecessarily difficult. Uh, and then kind of like turning off all those ineffective things or most of them <laughs> i still backslid sometimes right but most of them got turned off um so does that sound similar to like for you or is it maybe just slightly like a different angle no totally i think all the uh, like so what i kind of like learned is you get these awakening moments almost like and there's so many various degrees of it and um and yeah i think that's for sure similar because you're becoming the awareness of 
of something beyond just uh, the mental side of yourself, right? And once you get that glimpse and that separation, then as you said, you can do some changes there because you no longer are so consumed in just the patterns of those thought, thoughts and emotions and you can almost like watch it from a bird's eye view and that's just huge right because it's like you no longer are like oh that's like thoughts aren't really me they're just kind of like an operating system and i can change the way they uh or at least i can observe them and t t uh, use awareness to to try to uh, alter them eventually because even actually a cool thing in tennis or any sport right is like what I've learned is the way we train or the way the human works it or seems to anyways through my experience is that you train right like you do the stroke over and over again and then you program yourself to do it a certain way and then when you uh, step away from um, or if you're in a competition you try to allow the programming because you've practiced so much to take free hold and you become just the observer and that's like the flow state you you get there and you're almost like there's so many matches i've had where i was playing the most unbelievable tennis and it's like i was just observing the happenings of the shots I was um, just watching it from a distance and it's like you just trust the process because that's what the training is about is letting yourself be free and that's how the human seems to work it's like we're just programming it to do uh, things when it needs to right and when you can get out of your own way then it runs the most efficiently and it's yeah. almost also like you know walking like it's like you, we don't we don't think like when we're taking steps is okay put this much weight on the left foot or this foot you just practice it over and you fall down and you keep doing it and doing it and then it just becomes a natural thing that you don't even think about anymore right so yeah yeah so it's like you can drop a lot of the concerns about what other people are thinking. You can drop a lot of the self-judgments. I mean, all those things can consume energy and kind of distract you, right, from doing, from playing the game or whatever, right? Um, so you can play the best possible game that your, you know, your body can can play, right? Um, without, yeah, without being um, thrown off, kind of thing. Um, so I'm curious to get your opinion, like. So like my blog is kind of like, it, it is highly critical of um, the uh, religion. Mm -hmm. Like it can look like I'm totally just trying to attack and um, discount the, um, the usefulness of it. Um, but that's not the, the truth. The truth is that I'm just, I'm very concerned that it can be a harmful aspect of our cultural experience you know if used or internalized in the wrong way and that's what i'm trying to bring awareness to do you do you think that even if like if, even if a person doesn't do a lot of religious tradition do you think it's just a part of the culture that like we inherit somehow and that it goes into our mind and it creates it starts this uh, a lot of the, the things where people struggle with their mental health, like all the, ju the judgments and the unnecessary worries and the unnecessary fears. Like, do you think that most of us just kind of absorb this regardless? Yes, that's kind of how it does seem like. It's like, it's almost like a system, right? It's in place in, and I mean, in some ways it's good because when you don't have uh, like a deep connection to to truth, you can say, or something deeper within yourself or to God or whatever you want to call it, um, then you do things out of ego, I would say. So like your own, you think you're, um, 
you're going to do whatever it takes to, uh, like out of selfishness, basically, right? We're all kind of like operating in this kind of form of like, we want to succeed and do stuff. And from there, you need certain rules or like many people we see on the news, like steal stuff, right? Because they just, a lot of the times, maybe they're in bad circumstances or they're just so disconnected that they, they need certain rules to be in place to not do bad things, like not harm uh, your neighbor or whatever, right? Like it's, it's this kind of, so in that sense, maybe that system of religions is like useful because if we're in a very low conscious state, then, then you need a certain framework to not do bad things and then there's some kind of punishments to, to uphold that kind of system. But I think you're right. It's like when you're just kind of like um, it's propagated on you, then you people tell you some kind of rules and then you're like, you're this kind of like small being coming into the world, especially as a kid. And you're so malleable and like people tell you this is wrong, this is right, you should do this, you should not do this to get into this. So I think that's very limiting because our beings kind of want to explore life, right? And be totally uh, free to choose what we want to do. And of course, like um, we're almost like kind of animalistic in the beginning. It's like, so you need some kind of like framework to keep you in check in some ways. But after you kind of like get your survival needs met, it seems like that stuff needs to be dropped because then it's just a limitation. And then you're always thinking like, okay, I'm going to church to be a good person or whatever. Like I'm going, I'm going to go to heaven. Like, but then you see some people that go to church and then in the parking lot, they're like swearing at each other for a parking spot. So it's like, is this, <laughs> is this, like, is this real? Like, are you living this kind of religious life or are you just pretending to, to do it? Right. And I think that's the limitation for sure is like, most people, they're not living a religious life. They're, they're almost like upholding some kind of image because they feel like it's going to get them somewhere deeper. But it's like you, ha um, when you kind of like see that for yourself and like for you too, it seems like you got to a certain place where it's like you want to understand something deeper. Right. And then, then from there, those rules that are placed from other humans on top of us, those need to be dropped because you know already that like there's something within you that says like don't don't hurt this being or don't uh, lie or don't do that stuff those rules they don't need to be there like for you to not do this right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah like if yeah, you, like reach you reach a certain, a level, certain level of conscious, conscious awareness, awareness i think you said in your book too you just don't really have the desire to harm others or yourself like it kind of just goes away naturally right Mm -hmm. So you don't really need a prescription of rules to remember how to behave anymore, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that's true as well. But it just, it fascinates me how hard people cling to their beliefs, like, and maybe they, they, they feel that that's necessary, like, for where they're at in their development, right? Um, uh, like yeah, they, 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 they fight for it and protect it. And it's like, it's their, it's their sense of safety, security, family, um, their tribal identity, I guess you could say like, like, and I've been doing this really risky thing for the past while where I've been just distant, like disconnecting from the framework of, uh, the religion that I've been a part of for a long time. And I feel and I this feel like, like fear, fear that, you know, like if I don't, if I don't uphold, uphold that, that image, image, then they're all going to reject me. Right. Like it's this fear. Yes. Um, but, but at the same time, I can't stand any longer being in that confining space. Like I just can't take it. Like it's, it feels so like a waste of time to me. Like, I'm like, yes, like suffocating, right? Like you're mm -hmm. kind of limited by it for sure. And yeah, I think you're totally right. It's like belief systems are kind of like a safety net, right? Like that we kind of like put out. And I mean, 
they're great to have certain beliefs because it gets you through and you can do certain things, especially when you're in a low stage of development. But later on, you got to, the, the one thing is you have to be um, questioning your own beliefs. A lot of people like always live in the out external world, right? Like they're, they're always uh, dictating or like judging other people's beliefs. Oh, you think this way. Oh, this, that's bad. And they'll tell them about that. But they never, most people never take the time to introspect. Oh, wait a second. What is my baseline? Where, where, what's my, uh, reasoning behind any of this stuff? And when you start questioning, that's why questioning is so important. Like in my book, I, I talk about it, like, who am I? These types of deep questions, they cannot be answered from your mind. Your programming that you've took on from uh, uh, childhood, they, th there's like this void that exists because it's like the mind can't point to like, oh, this is you, this is, uh, this is real. Because you know how like even words, they all have, they're almost like inter, um, they talk about each other. So like a definition of a word points to another word. Then uh, that word points to another word. They never go like, to, like even like, so say the word tree, right? You look at a tree and there's something deep there that exists, it's not the word tree, right? Like a, a tree is not a tree. It's, we place the word on top of it. And most people, they live on that level of life is though on the words, they think they know it. They can picture some tree in their head and they think that's what a tree is. But it's the same thing for you. Your name and your ideas about yourself are the same way you know a tree than uh, the actual truth of you. And when you can actually realize when you look at a tree and you're like, there's this essence there, there's this depth that you can't even like talk about because it's alive, it's changing, it's moving. And that's when you get to that point for your own investigation internally, you start realizing that you don't know who you are. And when you don't know who you are, that's when the big like, uh, kabang happens because you're like, holy shit, I'm, I'm thinking I know all this stuff with all these beliefs and those are actually limiting me from actually touching that within myself. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean those are the, the exactly the kind of wordings, I guess, that I'm, I'm hoping to kind of acquire through these, through these talks. Like, it's just like bang on, like, um, for me anyway, like, it's almost like you're saying you're trying to say that's how you get to the point of knowing who you are like if you try to observe things and get to the essence and uh, you can have that i guess enlightenment experience is that right um, and I, I honestly don't know if i've again if, if i've reached that point it, it sounds like it's just a matter of continuous practice and you know uh, non-judgmental observing of of yourself your own thoughts and i guess the external world as well um and then uh, suddenly just something clicks right is that what you're saying exactly like there's certain practices you can do and people are drawn to all sorts of things but at the end of the day you just have to get to a point where you admit that you don't know why you're here where you're, what, what this is, and you can start dropping all the things you've gathered and then allow life to show you who you are. And, and that takes time. Like some people just, and the mind is very like cunning, right? It's clingy and it, it'll distract you in all sorts of things. Like it'll tell you, okay, let's chase this thing now. And like, let, let, let's get this many followers and we need to make this business, but that's just another form of survival. You're trying to better your survival because you're not happy with the, the way your survival is going now. Right? So when you, when you, when you, when you reach some success in your life and you feel like, okay, I've got there, that's when it's like usually prominent. Like you now are like, okay, I've made a business. I, I've, I've, I've had some relationships. I'm, I'm kind of happy. I'm in a set state. Then 
if you're ready, you can be like, okay, now I need to get to the bottom of what is this life? Like, what's the point of it? Who am I? What is real? That kind of stuff. When those questions become like a big priority in your life, that's when you can start like doing whatever practices you're kind of drawn to, right? And whatever teachers, but but there is no one way to get there. Like maybe for you, it's through skateboarding when it, like some click happens or through the therapy that you mentioned before, right? It's like whatever it is, but you have to be able to face yourself and especially all the things that you think that you are, right? Like your mind will always try to tell you I'm this, um, uh, don't worry, you don't need to look. Like a lot of the times what a, a big practice for me was like just staring in the mirror and saying like, who am I? And just constantly looking like until this kind of dissolving thing happens where I no longer judge what this face is or like how my features look, but just accept that this is life. Like this is, um, this is just happening at this moment. And that's why like, Eckhart Tolle or all, any all those teachers will say it is now it is here because the truth of you resides in the present moment and you have to just do the certain work to detach from your mind and then eventually it almost happens on its own like when you do put enough work it like it just shifts there's no way to get there on your own because you're the person who's trying to get there is the person who's blocking you from getting there, if that makes sense. It's very like uh, weird to even think about because it's, you can't understand it, but mm -hmm. um, it just kind of happens at, when you kind of surrender and uh, almost like you have to put in a lot of work, a lot of effort to learn how to surrender, right? So that's why like a lot of disciplines are forced and in kind of Zen traditions, they say, Oh, we got to really like get that person to get put all so much effort. And then when you start realizing that no matter how much effort you put, it won't help. And then that's when you can relax and that's when it happens. But it's it's so hard to talk about because like even in my book, I've tried to talk about it and everybody tries to talk about it. That's got that uh, experience, but it's an experience and and it you don't have to go to church to to have it you don't have to do anything like that you don't want to do whatever your being wants go do that and then once you've kind of like um realized that that's kind of like whatever you try to accomplish in life it's never good enough then one day you might get to a point where you're ready to just be like okay i'm tired of trying and let me just just live let let life just happen and that's mm -hmm. when it's like beautiful yeah, I think we live in the sort of the culture or world of never good enough. I think that's what, because I mean, almost everybody I talk to, like, it's never good enough. Like, their their looks are never good enough. They're never smart enough. Like, whatever they do for uh, their their job or their whatever their hobby, their sport, it's never ever good enough. So it's this persistent sense of inadequacy. Um, so, and I, I guess people even feel that way after they've made. Ten million dollars and have a mansion and a gigantic multinational business or whatever, right? They still feel it's still not good enough. It's never exactly. good enough. Exactly. Yeah, look at like even like Elon Musk and stuff. Like he's created so many amazing things, but he needs to keep going because his mind's running his life, right? Like and I'm not saying that's amazing that he's producing all this stuff. But at the same time, when you watch him, he's so uncomfortable with himself almost like you could almost see like in real time, his mind spinning like crazy and he's like taken in by it. And he's doing like he, he works like so many hours, like crazy doing all sorts of stuff. But it's like you can see that he's not very peaceful in mm -hmm. some ways. But um, that's my observation from outside. Not that he's like I find like a lot of stuff he's progressing in the world too right so it's kind of cool that way but um yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think it's quite fascinating like i'm kind of seeing this difference between some people like it seems like some people want to pursue i guess i would call it pursuing enlightenment and then 
And then there's some people that want to pursue religious conformity and they're like, that's the way to know the truth of all things is to be as obedient and conformed uh, as the church wants you to be. And if you do that enough, if you put in that work, then you'll know, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, but it's so different than what we're talking about here today. Like, and to me, like the religious conformity path is, it just seems like the way to illness to me. But I don't know, like if I'm making an improper judgment or because I haven't really dedicated myself to that, because it doesn't feel right to me or what, but do you see that there's those two kind of extremes and maybe a bunch of people in the middle somewhere? Yeah, totally. I think also like religions uh, for from my experience and my kind of like looking into them is like they're all pointing to the same thing that we're just we we're talking about is finding this truthfulness like Jesus he was basically an enlightened master and so was Buddha and then uh, they're all this kind of like tr the, so the funny thing is no religions are created really by the master right like it's people who listen to his talks and take it and then they create some kind of religion around that person but the funny thing is like the buddha is telling everyone they're the buddha because they are they just don't realize it and they're clinging to him like he's some special thing but he's telling them no you idiots you are that too you just think that i'm some great thing out there and some people right. need that to like to because they can't get there on their own so they need like years to of of that kind of like clingingness almost but but that becomes dead like you mentioned it's like it's very toxic because it no longer is imbibing that kind of like energy from that teacher because that's what he was speaking or um like resonating and people get it wrong and then they they kind of again uh, cling to some kind of rules show me how to do it I want to know but you you can't know because it's already like you you're the you're the stopping point from knowing it and then people take advantage of you right like yeah like religions in some ways are doing great stuff but in so many ways such harmful stuff right and then of course people take advantage and the the leaders of those pe places they're making money too, right? So it, like the power gets to, gets to you, and then all of a sudden you have all these following people, followers. So you're dependent on their money and contributions to, to uphold this business. So it's not about like trying to transcend something. It's it's to keep you there and like tell you, okay, this is because a, a true honest person will real uh, will kind of probably at some point uh things say no i i don't know anything you can come follow me but i don't know if i can help you <laughs> and um and that's what like a, a true honest person would say right because you don't know like what people are dealing with the uh, the way they're wired in some ways they have certain thoughts patterns and stuff and you can guide them but but at the end of the day you have no no extra power than any anybody else and we live in this kind of culture of like propagating someone on a pedestal and then bowing down to them but then you it's okay if that's helping you in some ways but at some time you have to realize that you are the same as them it's like a a janitor and a president it's the same thing like most people will view the president as the greatest holy person or whatever or like a big figure but then they'll put down like oh clean this you idiot or something right like and then that's the the missing point is that you're connected and you're both of these people and the way you treat one determines how you see you already divide within yourself this power dynamic that something is greater than something else but an ant and a, a dragon are the same embodied with the same essence which is kind of god or source or whatever and that same essence is within you but if you divide that in your view 
then you'll never see it because you you already made this kind of like block within yourself that oh okay this thing's important and this thing isn't but everything is important you can you can use anything to get to the truth hmm. Including religion, do you think? Or, or? Oh, for sure. If you, if, you, if you actually go to the depths of it, to the actual teachings of the, um, what, what they're pointing to, again, the pointers, right? It's always these pointers, but you have to truly, truly go in there and try to understand what it is uh, that they're, they're pointing to. And, and that's hard because it's so... It's so foggy now, right? It's it's hard. I guess I would argue that, I guess from my experience attending church and stuff, is that people just, they get good at, I call it jumping through hoops. Like they just, um, uh, they, they pay their dues, their tithing, they attend the church services. They, I don't know, like they do the movements that the church wants them to do. I don't, I don't. I don't know if it's deep investigation or if it's just sort of shallow compliance. I think my my bias is that it's just mostly shallow compliance, at least for the church that I attended. Um, and I I could be just that just could be a big fat assumption on my part, you know. And maybe people are deeper than I give them credit for. Um, but like, I guess in my experience, I was like I saw myself jumping through these hoops. And upholding this image, I guess, and it, but it didn't, it didn't take me to the place of wellness. Like I went for years and years, and I stayed on well in my in my mind and in my emotions. And then I started learning about this dialectical behavior therapy and practicing mindfulness, and that actually got me out of my toxic patterns. But the church didn't get me out of the toxic patterns. It, yes. it, I think yeah, it just think actually just got, got me to focus on jumping through these hoops as a way of attaining happiness. Um, but so that just didn't work for me. And um, so I wonder if it's the same for others who might have mental health vulnerabilities, you know, and they might be kind of thinking, well, if I conform enough and if I believe enough, then I'll be okay. Um, and I think that's kind of a lie. I guess. Yes, I think I think you're right in some ways. And also it depends on who's facilitating these these uh, religious experiences too, right? Like, that's the big thing is like, some places are probably great for some people and they're having like good connection, they're, they're maybe experiencing transcendence together, but you're right, I feel like, based on my experience of church as well, it was like, recite this thing, uh, there's some kind of talk about be, be good, don't, don't steal, and then it's like, okay, like, but there's no, there's no essence there. Like there's no depth and you're right. It's like, you're just kind of like, okay, I have to do this to make it to heaven or something <laughs> like just, but, but I don't feel better at all attending this thing. Right. Like, and I guess maybe for some people, they, they do get that depth there and that's uh, uh, helping their life in some way. But at the same time, they're not getting, maybe they're not interested yet or they're not ready for like the kind of like enlightenment or like higher conscious living. They're just kind of doing it as a kind of coping mechanism almost. Mm -hmm. And the narrative, the narrative that they, that they, they, they follow, follow, I think they, they insert, insert themselves right into, into the narrative, narrative right? right? So, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah, Jesus, Jesus died for my sins, sins I owe I him. him. Mm -hmm. I owe my life to him, basically, right? Because he did this, this miraculous, generous thing for me. And um, if I don't honor that, then I am going to face serious consequences at some point, right? And in the in the Mormon faith, like, and the thing that really disturbs me is that it's they 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 never quite say it directly, but it's like they're saying like if you don't conform enough, and if you don't if you aren't valiant enough in your efforts, then you could be separated from your family after you're dead. Um, because only, you know, you can only get to the top, like they have different tiers of heaven in their belief. And if you can only get to the top, if you do the right rituals and you, and you behave in the right way during your life. Right. Uh, and, um, I don't know. I don't know. To me, that's just like, um, 
It almost seems a tad emotionally abusive to me because you're just kind of like it's like this subtle threat that's kind of woven in woven into the messages mm -hmm. like i think they try and focus on the rewards so say like you'll get this great reward in the end right and yeah and it'll, it'll all be worth it but they also there's also this flip side that they they don't emphasize that you know you could be alone forever kind of thing right or or not with your family which is like it's an, i guess that's it just feels awful right since we're we're kind of like, like we're family, family social yes. beings, right? So um, totally. I guess I'm kind of rebelling against that concept in, in um, this podcast as well. Um, and I don't know if that's the only religion that kind of thinks of it that way. And uh, no, I think I think also like the Quran in some ways, it's like they say like heaven is like there was some kind of saying about like having something some amount of virgins waiting for you in heaven or something like if you're good in this life it's like a mm -hmm. promise it's almost like a promise to it's almost like a threat if you're not good here you're not going to get something there but but they're all kind of almost like scare tactics to get you to to obey which is which i find wrong too right like it's it's nothing should ever be really used as uh, like threats against you so like that's not a good way that's like that's like a you know like when the world dictators or like leaders are, are need like uh, so many bodyguards because they're always lying and cheating to everybody that they're scared to get killed but like true mm -hmm. leaders are very chill like they they're they're saying the truth so they're not really of course still nowadays you need to almost like have some kind of protection in some ways because maybe someone will try to kill you but <laughs> but um but yeah when you're like doing good for the people and for pe for society then you don't have to be afraid so much about your life because you're not you're you're not cheating the system right and then uh scared so so bad for your life so yeah well hey man this, like, this has been awesome um um and i'm going to do some like some deep reflection and thinking about um our conversation and uh and uh, articulate try and articulate a few things on my blog and um, I'm so thankful that you reached out to me and um, uh, you found it through just sort of like you saw that I made a link to your site. Is that how you found it? Or? Yes, I have like a, my website, behuman.zombie.com. And then you, uh, yeah, like sometimes when I was looking at the analytics um, and then it was said your podcast and I thought it was super interesting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. So I'm like, I, I clicked on it and I listened to one of your episodes, which I thought was great. And I, I, I just like your, how honest you are and just reflective and just not just saying this is the way it is. And um, like open mindedness is the key, right? Is just being uh, wherever you are in life and just reflecting in that and being as true as possible to who you are. That just like, it, it just, it gets you so much further in life and um and that's what i kind of appreciate about you because there's so many people who are very closed off this is what you need to follow this is how you're gonna get there and for some people they need that but um i'm more like uh i i like to be the space for others to be themselves right because when you're vulnerable and you you're honest, even the way you speak about religions, you're not sure, you're like, you're questioning this stuff. And I think that's the biggest, uh, um, like, draw is that you're, you're able to admit that you're unsure and you don't know and you're just doing this to better yourself. And that's the most beautiful thing. And that's why I reached out because um, there's, there needs to be more, like, conversations and honesty from people to so that then other people are more vulnerable when you're vulnerable i notice like people come and they're like oh i'm not scared to be myself either because i know this person's not going to just judge me all the time too 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it for me is about, I guess, mental health awareness and understanding how systems can help or hinder our, our, our health. Um, and just bring in awareness to that, I guess. Um, so that people can have more uh, options, I guess, right? And um, that they can understand, I guess, different ways of um, approaching their health and under I guess just grasping the bigger picture a little bit better. I think people tend to live in their bubbles, you know, like their little bubble. And um, one of the things like in being in mental health and hearing so many stories and getting to know so many people is that you like, it really expands your perspective and you're like, wow, like there's like, we do live in like a cultural context and there are these like common patterns and these, um, these issues that people fall into and it's really sucks to not know why you stay in pain, you know, like, <laughs> like people get to the point where they go around in the circle so many times, like they just, they want to die, right? Because they're, they're, there's so much misery that they're creating with other people like they did, but they don't understand why, right? They just, and then they just, and then they just ultimately blame themselves. They're like, I just must be just the biggest piece of shit in the world because I create I, I feel so much misery and I there's so much chaos going on around me like and then that leads to giving up right oh so, for sure yeah and I, I think that this discussion is exactly like what I'm aiming for to help you know bring awareness to some of these things and um, not totally discount I guess the institutions but also just kind of raise some flags and go like look like if you're using the systems and the institutions in a certain way and you have certain assumptions, it could, it could lead to devastation to, for you, you know, if you're not aware. So, so thank you so much for helping to bring that awareness and with your book too. And I, I of course recommend your book. I think it's great. Thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate being on here. And yeah, like you just said, it's, just giving people new options, right? Because there's not just one way to live. It's like there's so many different ways to go about things. And for you, maybe it's different than for another person. And, um, and that's okay. And it's beautiful to just learn from each other rather than just being kind of forced to uh, live in a box. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? And yeah, yeah, to be able to go beyond the boundaries if... Um, if you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks again. And um, yeah, I hope that we can stay in contact. This has been awesome. Uh, for sure. Anytime. And I'll link you on my website too. So more people can kind of see your stuff as well. All right. Appreciate it so much. So uh, have a great day. Hey? You too. Bye. Okay, thanks, Pavel.